Welcome to Earth Chapters, brought to you by Pollinator Friendly Alliance. You can find us at pollinatorfriendly.org. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots nonprofit powered by the enthusiasm of our partners and volunteers to protect the natural world, pollinators, and their habitats. Remember, everything in the natural world is connected. An ecosystem is a community of living things that work together and rely upon the other. Let's be great stewards of the ecosystem. Today's Earth Chapter is Biodiverse Backyard for Pollinators with me, Lori Schneider, and Native Plants for a Biodiverse Backyard with Bree Bowerly from Minnesota Native Landscape. So let's get started. To start with, I'd like to share a short list of things we can all do to be better stewards. An untidy landscape rich with diversity of flowering plants, shrubs, and trees is both beautiful and supports many species of wildlife. If we provide just five key components, we can create a sanctuary right in our own backyard. Just like us, pollinators and other wildlife need a nutritious diet and healthy places to raise their young and nest. Shelter, food, protection from pesticides, nesting sites, and clean water. So we can make it our job to help people change their perceptions or their definition of what a desirable yard is. So say farewell to turf and hello to biodiversity. In a world where urban sprawl and commercial agriculture are replacing our green spaces and natural, oops, habitats, um, backyard habitats and urban corridors are more and more crucial to holding together an increasingly fragmented landscape for pollinators, birds, and wildlife. Pollinators are essential for ecosystems and food systems alike. They're keystone species in most terrestrial ecosystems and crucial for biodiversity in any landscape. Pollinators are more than honeybees, as you see. Oops. I just lost my place. Hold on a second here. <laughs> Shifting me all the way to the end. Pollinators and native habitats co-evolve together. One important role native plants play is buffering climate change. All species have responded to climate changes throughout their evolutionary history, but a primary concern is the recent rapid rate of change where species show differential movements rather than shifting together as before. Important, two important effects are at play. One is asynchrony of pollinators and their plants. And two is the extinction of those specialized and less adaptable pollinators like wild bees. For example, glacier lilies in Colorado now bloom several days earlier than a few decades ago. They may bloom before the bumblebee queens emerge in spring, so they're not properly pollinating the bloom and there's a mismatch which is also not good for hungry bees that are emerging to find their flower foods are in short supply. There are more than 460 known species of wild native bees in Minnesota thanks to citizen science we are just now compiling important data from counts on diversity and number of bee species not known before. There's an estimated 150 species of butterflies and skippers and thousands of moths. We already had a pretty good inventory of Lepidoptera in Minnesota and therefore can confirm that many are endangered and threatened or at risk. We can help by transforming our backyards into a biodiverse plant and animal community 
and building corridors of habitat. Restoring and introducing native plant communities present, presents uh, many other benefits as well, like natural beauty, resilience, and their deep root system acts like a sponge to help fil filter um, excess nutrients and pollutants. Also, a healthy backyard ecosystem supports soil and plant health for natural control of pests and disease so that we can use less chemical pesticides and fertilizers. People prefer to live in communities with healthy land and water, which also increases property values. Reducing pesticides is a key ingredient in creating safe biodiverse habitat. Household choices have direct effects on species and ecosystems, such as habitat loss and pesticide contamination. In an ongoing study, we looked at native habitat adjacent to crop fields and found at least three pesticides and up to 22 present on each plant. Milkweeds had especially high levels probably because of the fuzzy large leaves that act as collection paddles. We also found that some applicators mix many, many pesticides together. Systemic insecticides such as neonicotinoids are absorbed into the plant's vascular system and express throughout the leaves, stems, pollen, and nectar, making the entire plant toxic to both target and non-target species. Be sure when sourcing plant materials to ask your nursery if they or their suppliers treated with systemic insecticides before buying. Most butterflies only forage a few yards from their nesting areas, which makes backyards and corridors important sanctuaries. The monarch butterfly is unique in its long migration. Some other butterflies migrate short distances and most moss, bees, wasps, and other pollinators hunker down nearby over winter. Look for these elements in a backyard biodiverse habitat, an untidy yard with a water source, mulch, wood chips, leaves, or compost piles, shrubs, trees, flowers, veggies, herbs, wood or mulch piles, pathways, patio, benches, pollinator lawn, bird and bee houses. We can create habitats and backyards, community gardens, underutilized lots, strips between lots, and other open public or private lands, small to large, and everywhere in between. So Let's look at what a biodiverse habitat looks like. Here's an example of an unused city lot. Volunteers with Pollinator Friendly Alliance took it over with the help of Minnesota Native Landscapes. Here is the before and here's the after. No pesticides were used in the prep or the maintenance of this project. So let's look at some more habitat ideas buffer strips and hedgerows. This buffer strip installed by Shoreview natives between a front yard and the street. Notice the habitat starts a safe distance from the road to avoid road salts. Buffer strips help filter runoff and provide borders at property line and lawn edges. They're especially useful near streams or any kind of water body. And most wild bees are ground nesters, so they would find this an attractive nesting area. Some wild bees nest in stiff stems or cavities or piles of mulch or wood, but 70% nest in the ground, so they need clear access to soil. This semi-natural area defines a border at the edge of a prairie grassland in suburban Bayport. So I am a big fan of hedgerows. They've been around for centuries and serve as habitat borders, windbreaks, they reduce erosion. 
and are essential for wildlife corridors, especially for birds. Hedgerows provide numerous benefits to wildlife. They're often a great way to incorporate larval host plants for butterflies, uh, above ground nesting bees, forage for other beneficial insects, nesting sites for all manner of birds. They create corridors through agricultural regions, um, wildlife shelter, fences for wildlife, and create erosion barriers, provide livestock, uh, protect livestock, and of course, increase biodiversity. In a backyard, hedgerows can be companion planted with a variety of large shrubs with showy flowers, colorful leaves, and fruit that attracts pollinators and provides food for birds and wildlife. You can plant a taller tree and a shorter shrub, then some tall flowers like bee balm next to one another to create these hedgerows or buffer strips. And there are plenty of flowering and fruiting shrubs like blueberry, dogwood, lilac, currant. Trees are important too. They're first sources of pollen for bees in the spring, like red maple, willow, and elm. Later in the summer and fall, nectar and fruit from crab apple, plum, service berry. And there's a lot of others as well you see here this is another link that will be available at the end of our talk so stick around for those trees are also important for host plants for butterflies and moss in particular the polyphemus moth lays its eggs in oaks the caterpillars develop there and surround themselves with silk and a leaf becoming a cocoon that overwinters, looking much like a part of the brush or tree. So in early summer, the moth emerges as a beautiful giant silk moth. Overwintering and hibernating pollinators could easily be raked, or raked up or pruned away with the brush. So please leave your leaves and stiff stems up until late spring. I know it's especially tempting now when many people are at home to start gardening. And there are plenty of tasks we can do such as pruning trees and shrubs, mulching and prepping veggie beds, sprouting seeds. If we carefully trim down last season's plants, as long as they're not hollow stemmed, because that's where the beneficial insects will overwinter. So let's talk about those flying flowers, the butterflies. Butterflies need nectar to provide energy for flying and reproduction. So a good butterfly habitat provides plants for all life stages, host plants for egg laying and caterpillar food and nectar plants for food for the adult butterflies. Also protected areas for them to pupate rest or hide from predation and to overwinter. Butterflies like to bask in the sun on open flowers and flat rocks. They need the sun to warm their wing muscles so they can fly. They also require extra salts and nutrients to mate from puddles, mud, or even dung. This is called puddling. The key to choosing flowers for your yard is to include a variety, variety of colors and shapes, short to tall, spring to fall. Some pollinators are specialists and need very specific plants and others are generalists and can utilize many. So having a, a wide variety for all is ideal. Butterflies also like grasses where they will often hang out low hidden at the base of the grasses in the cool weather and away from predators. Here are a few examples of some native flower groupings. Pollinators like to uh, like clumps of colors or strips of like flowers. 
So plant a variety of heights to attract different beneficial insects and pollinators and try to bunch several together um, that are like color or, oh, hi. Um, watch for some links at the end of our talks with plant lists, lots of plant lists. Here we go. So pollinator lawns. It's, it's my dream that someday we can replace those herbicide treated turf lawns with pollinator lawns. We recommend scalping the turf grass first, adding a layer of compost, and then seeding over that for ultimately a flowering carpet of habitat, four inches or more, and mowing just three times a year. Check out Lawns to Legumes State Match Program to help residents install poll pollinator lawns and habitat. That link will be at the end as well in the chat. Include organic herb and veggie gardens in your biodiverse backyard plan. Herbs such as thyme and oregano can be intermixed along with the rest of the garden and they're great pollinator plants. You can use companion planting for pest control with veggies like tomatoes and basil, squash and nasturtium. They're also great pollinator plants. I'm Bree Bowerly. I'm, uh, I work for Minnesota Native Landscapes. Um, I'm our outreach coordinator, so I get to do a lot of these fun activities, and I really enjoy talking about native plants, and hopefully I will be able to answer um, everybody's questions at the end, and uh, otherwise I'm just going to kind of cruise along here. Um, hopefully not too much uh, overlap with what Lori had to talk about, but um, I want to talk a lot about different native plants. Um, when we're talking about native plants, we're really talking about plants that are indigenous to this region um, with seeds uh, sourced locally. So um, these are plants that have been in Minnesota a lot longer than um, humans have um, and uh, with local remnant uh, gathering locations um, and then grown um, locally. From those seed sources. So that's what we mean by native to Minnesota. Uh, a lot of times we're talking about herbaceous plants, um, but of course there's a great variety of native trees and shrubs as well. And a lot of those are species that um, that you're used to seeing, you know, the oaks and the cherries and birch and all of those um, great trees and uh, shrubs. And again, Lori mentioned that um, trees and shrubs are some really great uh, spring Pollen, uh, pollinator uh, beneficial species. So they're not to be discredited or forgotten about when you're planning a pollinator planting. Um, when, when using native plants or considering uh, incorporating native plants into a biodiverse backyard planting, um, it's important to remember that, that there's a lot of great benefits uh, to humans as well as pollinators and then other local wildlife. And I try to touch on that later, but um, it, in general, these plants are lower maintenance than traditional landscape plants. Um, they're, they're hardier and uh, require a lot less maintenance and maintenance costs. Um, I think there's no soil amendments needed, and really that depends on, on kind of the planting that you're planning. Um, but in general, if you have a sandy soil dry backyard, um, there's going to be a huge variety of native plants that you can plant right into that soil without need for um, adding topsoil or bringing in compost. Um, and sometimes that just in, introduces more weeds into your planting area. So in general, um, if you're picking plants that are uh, for your soil type, um, and, and then your soil type, you know, you don't necessarily have to send it in for testing. You just, if it's dry and sandy, let's pick some prairie plants that are dry and sandy, um, prefer, or, uh, prefer that soil type. And then no irrigation needed, you know, if you're gonna start with live plants, uh, in general, uh, just water them until they get established. And, and for the long term, um, that you don't need to irrigate native plantings um, like a lot of people irrigate turf lawns and, and waste a lot of uh, water that way. So native plants are great for that. Um, I'll try to breeze through here. Native plants are great for a lot of reasons, uh, including erosion control and water quality. 
with their um, infiltration benefits, reducing runoff and filtering the groundwater with those really complex um, intricate root systems. Uh, the majority of native species will be suited for upland areas. Um, so if we're going to talk about getting the widest diversity of native plants for, um, for pollinators, a lot of times those are going to be your upland uh, sunny planting areas. And not everybody has a yard that has those conditions, but that's okay because there are native plants that you can use um, for different conditions. And I'm going to highlight a few of those here uh, a little bit later. Um, but pollinators and our native plants have co-evolved for each other's benefits. So when uh, monarchs are returning from their migration or when bumblebees are um, coming out of hibernation, there are native pollen and nectar sources available uh, at the right time for those pollinators. That's what we mean by um, co-evolve for each other's benefits. So, you know, you can source cultivars and, and other plants that look like native plants, um, but if they're not the, the native version for your area, the timing might be off just such that they're not really providing as, um, you know, good of benefits as they can. So uh, we're really talking about this uh, association between native plants having what uh, native pollinators need when they need it. Um, and so they're kind of great for giving uh, native plants uh, that reproduction, this, the seed uh, and our fruits and vegetables, uh, and then native pollinators uh, rely on these for, for food and shelter. And Lori showed some really cool slides for that. Um, so <laughs> not just backyards, but you can also put these plantings in your front yard. And uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot of plants that people recognize as native plants um, that, are, that are maybe cultivars or um, otherwise, and, and they're great, but we can do better too. And we can really increase our diversity um, as the market for native plants uh, grows and, um, and then the knowledge base grows here um, around Minnesota. So when we're selecting uh, plants for pollinators, there's a few considerations to uh, keep in mind, and I shorten them kind of to what I call the rules of three. So um, one is based on like the NRCS guidelines for a pollinator friendly habitat, and that's having at least three blooming plants for each uh, part of the growing season. So that would be early, middle, and, and late growing season or spring, summer, and fall basically. And that's really a minimum. So at a minimum, um, we're looking for nine blooming species in a pollinator planting. And we can do upwards of 40 different blooming species at a time if we're able to find um, you know, the highest diversity of plants, again, for kind of those dry, sunny planting areas. But we can do a lot better than nine. Um, but try to keep in mind, as a minimum, we want three blooming plants in the spring, three in the summer, and three in the fall time. And then beyond that, um, three plant types. Uh, the host plants, nectar plants, and habitat plants to include all, all of those types in your pollinator plantings as well. So I'm gonna kind of uh, break down what each of those mean here. So host plants are um, gonna be uh, for, widely for butterflies, for example, would be um, the food source for their larval stage. And, and common milkweed is a really well-known host plant. Um, and we use monarch butterflies as like a really charismatic um, pollinator species that um, a lot of people are excited about uh, conservation and, and uh, providing habitat for, for monarchs. So they're a really great um, example species to use. And, and milkweed is a great uh, plant for incorporating into native uh, pollinator plantings because it is so adaptable. So there's some, there's, different um, varieties of milkweed that are native to Minnesota. And um, there are um, like a good market for finding them now. And uh, in a just a typical garden setting, you could include marsh milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and common milkweed as long as the soil is um, rich enough to, uh, to keep marsh milkweed uh, a little bit more uh, moist soil. Um, butterfly milkweed provide prefers a drier soil type um, and then common milkweed can grow uh, in, in a lot of different uh, soils and in the same with uh, showy milkweed and then there's shady uh, variety of milkweed called poke milkweed and the 
hottest, driest soils can um, accommodate world milkweed. And um, so, you know, these plants are available. Um, and so just consider, you know, using some of those unique species in addition to um, the well-known milkweeds. And then, um, you know, while milkweed is the larval host for uh, monarch caterpillars, it also is a really great nectar resource for a wide variety of pollinators. So um, it's important for more than just monarchs. And that's true of, of a lot of our native host plants. So here's just a small list. Um, and I just put this together based on plants that we typically grow in our greenhouses. But um, the picture here is uh, pussy toes and those are uh, painted lady caterpillars. Uh, it, and they really do a number on the uh, seedlings in the greenhouse, but that's okay, we don't mind. In fact, when we bring these uh, six packs of native plants to like native plant sales, they're always the first ones to go is, is people would love to take home these caterpillars and uh, raise them up into butterflies and have a host plant right there for them. So that's a really great species. Um, I don't think it's used enough in, uh, in like bee lawns or um, well, I guess it would be a butterfly lawn, but it's a really cool plant that we could uh, be incorporating more into uh, backyards, whether it's in a garden setting or just as part of the lawn. It's kind of a slow spreader, but it's a nice short growing native species that really does well in a, a dry, sunny soil. Golden Alexanders are host to the black swallowtail. Uh, violets host fritillary butterflies. Uh, and like uh, wing lithrum is a loosestrife, a native loosestrife species. And it uh, hosts these weevils that are used for uh, purple loosestrife biocontrol. So just having more of these types of plants around um, aids in our, uh, our mission to reduce the spread of these really terrible invasive species like purple loosestrife. So um, otherwise, uh, what? Violets do a really great job of hosting, um, well, not necessarily hosting as a larval host, but they're a great nectar resource for uh, minor bees, mason bees, and then surfid flies um, visit them, uh, feeding on stray pollen. Uh, then there's the trees and the shrubs like uh, cherries and oaks and willows and birch that are all really important host plants. And um, of course, there's, um, Asters and goldenrods play host plant, but they also are really, really important fall nectar resources. And I think I'll touch on that um, here in a bit, as long as I have enough time. Uh, moving on to nectar plants. So this is probably the widest variety of available species. So these are just plants that are uh, really nutritious with their pollen and nectar content. Um, and they are kind of uh, really nice to look at in a garden. So great for incorporating into uh, backyard planting. And then this is where we really wanna see those uh, variety of bloom times. Again, the spring, summer, and fall bloomers. And um, we can pick species that are attractive to um, any traditional gardener, such as like the, the beard tongue and lupin, uh, black-eyed Susans and clone flowers. Those are kind of our mid-season bloomers and, and really easy to find. Uh, the seed is pretty widely available as well. And then again, that goldenrod and aster, the fall nectar resources. These are um, larval host plants, but then also just providing that really important late season nectar for our hibernating pollinators, as well as those that are gearing up for migration. Meadow blazing star is one that we can't uh, forget to mention by name. Um, just a super, super um, rich nectar source, especially for the monarch butterflies. Um, you never see as many uh, in one place in Minnesota as you would on on uh, a field of blazing uh, meadow blazing star, the Latchus ligula stylus species um, in particular. So then host um, host plants a, a little bit here, but um, what we call habitat plants are like bunch grasses and native sedges. Um, they're great for pollinator nesting, especially um, for those uh, like native bee species. Uh, Another thing that the bunch grasses do that we don't think about a service they provide would be um, holding the flowers upright. So making those flowers um, visible for pollinators uh, and visible to us uh, for aesthetics, but um, they provide these gaps in between the bunches uh, where native pollinators can nest in the soil. 
And then they are also host plants for native moths and our skipper and skipperling uh, small butterflies. Um, so when we're selecting native plants uh, to use on a project, uh, project or on your property, um, it's a little bit different than uh, when selecting for garden uh, variety plants and you're looking at zones, you know, am I in zo zone 4B or what zone am I in? Um, when you're looking to select native plants, really looking at um, historical data, uh, is this species native to my county? Um, is it native to within 200 miles of where I am? And you can really even narrow that down to, you know, is this native to 50 miles from where I live or um, something a little bit closer even. And there's so, some really great resources that we have um, Minnesota Wildflowers website, each VC has a native uh, history map. Um, the DNR Restore Your Shore website here um, is really cool for, um, you know, selecting conditions like uh, your own project area. You know, are you looking to do a shoreline planting? You can um, select these different characteristics and qualities and come up with um, your own custom list of different species that might be right for your project. Um, it's not necessarily all encompassing, it doesn't include all native species, but it gives you definitely a really good place to start. So between uh, Minnesota wildflowers, uh, Restore Your Shore, um, Minnesota Wild Ones has some great information, um, and, and so on. Uh, there's some really great resources out there for, for selecting native plants, um, as well as just contacting native plant vendors um, and getting their lists of different species available. And so when we're talking about creating a biodiverse backyard planting uh, for pollinators and our own aesthetics, there's also um, considerations for other local wildlife. So it's really great habitat for uh, songbirds uh, <clears throat> when attracting insects and pollinators to your yard. Uh, it's kind of a twofold benefit. You're also attracting songbirds that want to feed on those insects um, and another food source for those songbirds. Um, for year-round uh, feeding would be uh, that seed source, so like fall seed um, or winter seed uh, that's staying upright. So again, delaying mowing and not cutting things back till late spring um, is important for more than just pollinators, but these other creatures sharing our backyard habitats. Um, the Audubon Society does have a native plant selector tool as well, um, and again here you're going to put in your zip code and um, come up with a custom list of native plants for your area that are beneficial to birds, which is great. <clears throat> okay, so just some examples here of different uh, species that you could choose. Um, a lot of these are going to be species that are beneficial to pollinators, like I said, um, but then also just those uh, great nutritious seed sources. And um, you can get these plants in seed or you can get them in plant, uh, plant plugs. And, and kind of doing a combination of both is a great way to uh, get some instant gratification by using live plants to start as well as um, those more diverse species um, as a seed, seed starter and, and just being patient as those um, establish over you know, the first three years of, of their growing cycle um, or growing seasons. <clears throat> and then so if you don't have a dry sunny yard, um, there's other options. So you can plant your woodland understory or shade garden um, with native plants and they're maybe more limited to, you know, 18 different native plant uh, forbs or, or wildflowers that are uh, easily accessible um, in the native plant market but you're still gonna be able to provide those spring, summer, and fall blooming plants. If you already have an existing perennial garden bed, uh, you can add uh, plants, native plants that behave well um, in, a, in a garden bed, something like butterfly milkweed or purple prairie clover or even purple coneflower, some of these native uh, well-known species that look nice, um, but then also provide some, some benefits to the local wildlife. If you have a low-lying area, you could consider rain gardens, a shoreline planting. Uh, if you have a large development that has a stormwater basin, a lot of times those are planted with a relatively low diversity seed mix. Um, consider uh, upgrading that to a, 
uh, native seed mix uh, for stormwater retention. And then um, septic mounds are another great one where you can use native plants uh, with their non-damaging fibrous root systems on top of your septic mound. You're just really looking to avoid something with a like a more of a tree or shrub type root that's going to potentially damage your mound system. But native fibrous roots are, uh, are perfectly fine to use on septic mounds and uh, other seed mixes available for those. And then um, I think Laurie touched on a lot of these, but what other things can you do other than um, you know, incorporating diverse native plantings, uh, avoiding insecticides and systemic herbicides, especially in the plants that you're buying? Um, if you're purchasing traditional plants from a local garden center, uh, choose species that are nectar rich. Um, you, know, you have just as many painted lady butterflies on your uh, autumn joy sedums in the fall time as you do on your gar uh, goldenrods, but you know, finding a balance of, of those is great. Um, butterfly houses and bee houses, I would prefer to just use uh, stick piles, mulch, snags, things like that, but they are something that's commercially available that you could try as well, especially for citizen science or um, working with, you know, preschoolers or, or young school children and, and um, really having those uh, houses to watch and look at. And then as Lori said, um, delaying mowing, leaving those stems upright, um, over the winter for nesting uh, and um, those seed sources for um, wildlife that stay here over the winter and don't hibernate like birds. And I, that's all I got. Thank you for joining us for today's Earth Chapter. Thanks to Pollinator Friendly Alliance, our host, and Ramsey County Soil and Water our co-host. If you have questions or inquiries, please contact pollinatorfriendly.org.